Good afternoon. I'm Pastor Shepherd from Grace Bible Fellowship Church of Ann Arbor, and we greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for another opportunity to study with you God's infallible book. We're in the book of Romans, and if you've been with us the last several weeks, you've been with us in Romans as we talked about uh, the foundation of God's Word for us today being in the book of Romans. There are six, six books of the Bible that are collated together and produce they call this Biblios, uh, little books uh, put together by different uh, authors at different times over a period of 1,500 years. And yet when you come to the book of Romans, it's, it's, a, it's a special book. Uh, all, the words, all the Word of God is pure, and all the Word of God is, is special. But Romans speaks specifically to us today uh, as Gentiles in what the Bible calls the dispensation of the grace of God. And the dispensation of the grace of God is a specific time frame where God is dispensing the riches of his grace. Uh, he's not pouring out his wrath today uh, in spite of what people might say about prophecy being fulfilled or, or intervening in, in the affairs of men in spite of what uh, pundits might say or what Old Testament scripture says about Israel's program. He, he's offered to all men without distinction, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, male and female, all different, the whole world is savable today because of what Jesus Christ uh, did at Calvary, what he accomplished. And that's, that's why Romans is a special book, because it not only talks about what, what was predicted in Old Testament scriptures about a Savior coming, but it explains what Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross at, at Calvary. And there are specific terms in the book of Romans that Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote it, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 13, Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. So Paul doesn't magnify himself. He calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. He, he magnifies uh, the exalted, glorified Jesus Christ, not the Christ of, of prophecy, but the Christ according to Revelation and the mystery. If you've been with us, you've studied Romans 16, 25 and 26, where the apostle Paul says, Now to him is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation of the Mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So Paul's distinctive ministry and message he calls my gospel is separate from the twelve. It's a message that is given to Paul by Christ after his resurrection to reveal to him uh, the cross of Calvary and what Jesus Christ's cross work accomplished. And then the pages of scriptures record uh, what, what, what was intended to be given to us as Gentiles uh, and, and Jew in the dispensation of grace. Uh, by the way, let me just say it this way. There's no difference today between a Jew and a Gentile according to God's purpose. In times past, when God called out Abraham, there was a difference. He made a difference. Uh, God Almighty set up the middle wall petition, Ephesians 2 that separated the Jews from the Gentiles, and he also gave Israel the covenants and also gave them the law. He never gave the Gentiles the law. So today in the age of grace, what God has done after Israel rejected their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the wrath of God was supposed to be poured out in the book of Acts in fulfillment of prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel, and, and, and Jeremiah's 70th week, or the, the 70 weeks of years in, in the book of Daniel, then the wrath of God was supposed to be poured out after uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but, but God Almighty in his eternal wisdom and his eternal plans and purposes uh, revealed a secret purpose where he held back the wrath and he began to save enemies. Not his friends, not his covenant people, but his enemies. And what Paul begins to do in the book of Romans in chapter 1, 2, and 3, and God, Paul through the, God, the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, he begins to bring, bring the whole world guilty before God. Uh, you see, my friend, unless you know you're in a predicament or you're in danger, you'll never cry out for help. So what the scriptures are designed to do is to conclude all men in unbelief, to conclude all men under sin, to conclude all men guilty and without hope and helpless without God in the world. So what Paul begins to do is explain how God had a solution for my sins. And it's not in the efforts of what I can do by my own human goodness. I have none. Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 9 and 10 said, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. It said none. That means me too. That means you. 
Then he says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Folks, to come short of the glory of God is to come short of his standard of, of perfection, his standard of righteousness, his standard of justice, his standard of mercy, his standard of, uh, of wisdom. I don't have it. It's, it's the creator of, uh, of heaven and earth, and I'm a creature. So I don't possess these things that God possessed in myself. And then my main problem is that I was born in Adam. And so through Adam, one man sinned into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So there's, there's not only I'm a sinner by uh, what I do, but I'm also a sinner by nature. And the condition that I was born in this world, shaping in iniquity and born in sin, I, I couldn't do anything to change it. Only God could. So what we're going to study today is the issue of uh, what's called in the Bible the faith of Christ. And the term the faith of Christ is found in Paul's epistles alone. And what the term the faith of Christ is, 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 is the doctrine is talking about is how what, what I, what God Almighty required for the sin debt, the penalty for sin, then Jesus Christ stepped into human history, the second person of the Godhead, God in human form. The, the, the word became flesh, uh, John 1, 14 says, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ becomes the God-man, the man Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, this fantastic verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2 says there's one mediator between uh, God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all uh, to be testified in due time. And Paul is the due time testifier of the ransom that Jesus Christ paid at Calvary, where he was made sin for us, even though he knew no sin, that, that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. That's what the faith of Christ is about. Me not trusting in my own human works or my own human efforts. And by the way, if you want to, God will let you work to get to heaven. But your works will have to be perfect from the day you're born to the day you die. And here's what the kicker is about that one. Your works have to be perfect in word, thought, or deed. That means you could have never had a bad thought or evil thought, a wicked thought. It's not what you do. God looks, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And the word of God is quick and is powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing of sunder of soul and, 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 and spirit and joints of marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. So God looks upon our hearts. That, that's where we are, our, our will, our soul, our inner man life. And he sees the thoughts and the intents of my hearts. I, I don't always see him, and you definitely don't see him. And I don't see yours, but God knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. So in order to be accepted before God on the basis of your own human works, your own human effort, your good deeds, your good works. You have to be perfect from the day you die, born until the day you die, in word, thought, or deed. Now, if you're honest with yourself, you say, that's impossible. God says, I know it. So that's why I sent my son to Calvary uh, to pay for your sins, because he was perfect. Uh, Jesus Christ said, which of you convicted me of sin in John chapter 8? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says he knew no sin. Uh, Jesus Christ came and he was the spotless, sinless son of the eternal God. Matter of fact, the scriptures calls him the Lamb of God that beareth away the sins of the world. A lamb without spot and without blemish. A type that was manifest in the Old Testament scripture. So with that being said, uh, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3 verse 19. I said that earlier. And I want you to see when Paul gets to Romans chapter 3, he's bringing a conviction against mankind. Uh, individual uh, sinners, not the nations, but men. And then he says in verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that under the law, that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is not to make you better, it's, it's to condemn you. My wife and I were talking earlier about one of the uh, religious groups out here that does the doxology, where they uh, go to a song where they actually start reciting the Ten Commandments. Uh, and they cite, recite them as though they're supposed to keep them. And that's fascinating. That's religion. But the verse here that says that God gave the Ten Commandments the law that every mouth might be stopped. 
and all the world may become guilty before God. So then he makes the conclusion, therefore, by the deeds of the law, and that word deeds in the King James Bible means works. By the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The, nothing wrong with the law, Romans chapter 7 says. The law is your schoolmaster. It's to bring you under Christ. It's, it's designed to show you that you're a sinner, but not only a sinner, a hopeless, helpless sinner, but not only a hopeless, helpless sinner, but a sinner who's being made guilty before God. Therefore, there's a judgment day coming, folks. There's a day of recompense. There's a day that uh, God says, vengeance is mine, I, I will repay, saith the Lord. And so no, no evil work's going to be undone. No, no evil work's going to be uh, just hid, hidden under the carpet. And God's going to wink at it. Because you're dealing with the issue of God's his, his holiness. And, and when the Bible says it all comes short of the, the glory of God, it's talking about attributes or characteristics of what makes God God. One is, is his holiness. Uh, folks, God can never sin. And his holiness stands there, and it, it, it stands as a standard of what God's righteousness uh, is, is made up of. Now, his righteousness is made up of his justice and his uh, holiness. And so when you see that, then, then God's holiness has been offended by man, so his justice has to be satisfied, and his righteousness has to be executed. So therefore, we're all guilty. And so when you're dealing with the holiness of God and the justice of God and the righteousness of God, you're talking about his attributes. So that's why in verse number 20 he says that, uh, he says that no flesh should be justified in his sight. That word justified means to be declared righteous. It's just as though you never sin. Now, that's, that's amazing because under the verse, verse 19 and 20, all men are guilty. But look at the next verse. And here's our lesson. We're going to start now. Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. It's unto all, but it's upon, on and upon them that it believes, and there's, for there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And he goes down to the passage, and we'll, we'll explore uh, those terms that are there, when Paul begins to give his gospel, it's Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 28, where he begins to explain how the righteousness of God can be uh, given or imputed or counted to my, my account as a guilty sinner. How can God be just and, and still holy and yet deal with my sins in a just and a holy way? It's by the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ is that term in verse number 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now notice this, it's unto all, but it's only upon them that believe. It's an it's a unrestricted, uh, no, no restrictions on who can accept or who can have the availability of the righteousness of God through Christ. So, but, it's, but it's only given to them or imputed to them that believe it. So the only requirement that God has for you is faith. Faith in the finished work of Christ at Calvary. That's what it's called, Christ's finished work, his redemptive work, his complete work, his total work to be able to be, be the justifier of them which believe in Jesus. That's what God's able to do. He's able to justify you. Now, that, that term, the faith of Christ, is a term that's unique. And I, I, wanna, I hope I can break this down for you, that it, it's made clear when we get through with the lesson. The faith of Christ is not his faith, is his trustworthiness. His trustworthiness to be believed. And it's based on his, the proof, his evidence. I want you to come with me over to Romans chapter, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. I'm sorry, Philippians 3, 7. Philippians 3, 7. I think it's on the board now, on the, on the screen. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. And here, this term is really, really made clear. It's really brought out. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, when Paul is talking about his religious uh, activity, verse number 5, circumcised the eighth day of the, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of, of the Hebrews as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, 
But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things, but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might be found in him. Here's the verse. And being found where? In him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Notice verse 9 carefully. And being found where? In him. Not in the religious system, not in my own human efforts, but being found in him. That's Jesus Christ. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Paul is talking about a performance-based system. And we just read in Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, the only purpose of the law is to bring all men guilty before God. So Paul, he was, he was ignorant of the purpose of the law. He thought the law was God's standard for him to, to work righteousness, and yet it was very, the very thing that was condemning him to a place of eternal judgment and separation from God. But that which is through the faith of Christ, that's the fidelity. The faith of Christ is his faithfulness, his trustworthiness, his ability to be trusted. That's why Paul said, I'm not going to trust in my human efforts, but I'm going to trust in the, the, the son of, of the living God who loved me and gave himself for it. That's what he says over in Galatians. Notice this. Jesus Christ loves you, folks. Whoever is listening to me in that office, and nobody ever loved you, I'm going to tell you something right now. God loves you. You know that verse in John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved. You can finish that because everybody knows that verse. You see it all over kind of signs and, and, and stadiums for sports or uh, in arenas or track meets, wherever you see the sign, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, the issue there is the issue of the wrath of God, folks. It's the second death. That's what it's called, the death in the lake of fire, the death of a soul. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, what is the profit of a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Well, folks, a lost soul is not one that just ceases to exist. It's, it's a soul that has been created, and it, it, doesn't, it won't accomplish the purpose of what God intended for a soul to accomplish when he made Adam. God told Adam, he, he, he says, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. And it says he's formed man from the dust of the earth. That's his body. He breathed into his nostril the breath of life. That's his spirit. And man became a living soul. But what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose not his body, not his spirit, but his soul? That's the place of what, what the Bible calls the second death. It's called perishing in John 3. And that's what Paul's talking about here when he said he loved me. In Galatians chapter 2, he loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me and he gave himself for me. He goes to Calvary and he accomplishes everything that the justice of God needed so the righteousness of God can be satisfied and his holiness can be vindicated at Calvary's cross where he takes the penalty of the wrath of God for me and for you. And he accomplished it. That's why on that cross he said, it is finished. And then over in Acts chapter 2, it says it wasn't possible for death to, death to hold him. So Jesus Christ became a man to go and pay for man's sin, the very thing that Adam bought in the world. He, he goes and he conquers death, and he conquers the grave, and he conquers Satan, and he puts away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Do you realize and understand, according to scriptures, the only person that can put away sin is Jesus Christ? I, I was just thinking about you and I. What sin have you ever been able to put away, if you're honest? I'm not talking about getting drunk or, you know, committing adultery or, or lying. How about you can't just leave certain foods alone that's killing you? That's a good one there. Nobody seems to talk about that. That I, I eat some food that I'm so consumed by, I can't even stop until I'm dead. Or I worry. Things, things that I can't control or change about other people or other things. Well, Jesus Christ died for that, too. He put that away. And every, everything that man needs to be set free from the corruption and bondage of sin, Jesus Christ accomplished at Calvary. That was part of God's eternal purpose. It's called the faith of Christ. And what Paul understood after being convicted on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 
when the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory says, Saul, Saul, why persecute not thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, It's Jesus whom thou persecuted. And he said, It's hard for thee to kick against some pricks. And Paul said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And Paul there surrendered. There's a verse that I didn't have in my lesson, but I'm going to turn to it. And I don't, it's not on the screen, but I want you to listen to it. It's Paul begins to go back to his conversion, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for he counted me faithful, put me into the ministry. That's his apostleship. Now watch this. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the faith of Christ again. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. And he says, whom I'm chief. If you're a sinner today, folks, you're the sinner for whom Christ died for. But remember Romans chapter 3, he says, it's unto all, but it's only upon them that believe. You have to believe that Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that's called the, the gift of God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Notice this, it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. I can't make it any clearer to uh, help you understand that God's looking for you to trust in his son, a person, not in your own human works or some religious activities, but in he who loved you and he gave himself for you, the faith of Christ. And then he says, how be it for this cause, I'm still in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, I have turned mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for, and listen to this, a pattern for them who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. I'm going over to the board now because I want to point out some things about what Paul's talking about. When Adam sinned in times past, sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. That's Genesis chapter 3. And so the world is, is found and it just rebels in evil because Satan becomes the god of this world and the whole world is in the lap of the wicked one. So God gives up the nations, Genesis chapter 11. I mean, the book of Genesis is a time chart, folks, of the Bible. Genesis and Revelations. And he calls out Abram. And through Abram, he makes a covenant of circumcision. And his people are the nation of Israel. They come forth, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, ultimately leading to Jesus Christ, who is the seed of David, who is the seed of Abraham. But the Gentiles are given up to idolatry. They're given over to Satan. When Jesus Christ comes to the world, he, he's born of a virgin, so he doesn't have the sin nature that you and I have, but he has a human nature, and he lives for 33 years, 33 and a half years, to come and accomplish his, his purpose that God the Father preordained before the world began at Calvary, where he dies for sin. And he's made sin on that cross. Now, I'm going to move over here because I want you to understand when he's made sin, he actually suffers what the Bible calls, and I don't know if you can see this on my, my board, but it's called the second death. That's the lake of fire. That's over here in the future where Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, where it says, and I saw the dead standing before God. And I saw the dead, it talks about the dead giving up uh, those for judgment. And they were all judged uh, out of things written in the book. It says death and hell were cast, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is called the second death. That's being made sin over here. It's the wrath of God being poured out, folks. That's what the predicament you and I are in as sinners. We're subject to the second death, the lost soul. But what Jesus Christ did at Calvary, he comes and he intervenes in the human history on this cross. And by the way, folks, the only, way, the only time God intervened in human history, or will intervene in human history today, is through this cross. He's done everything he can do to satisfy his justice. is satisfied at Calvary. His righteousness is executed on that, that cross where he, he lays upon his son the iniquity of us all. Jesus Christ has made an offering for sin. That's what he becomes. He's transformed into sin. And yet, he's raised from the dead because the justice of God was satisfied. It wasn't his sins he would die for. And he had none. He's dying for mine and yours. And the, the justice of God, has, God the Father, raises him from the dead to sit on the throne of glory. And yet, something happened amazingly. When the nation of Israel, the Holy Spirit is poured out, and I didn't put that there, the Holy Spirit is pointed out on the 12 in the early Acts. And yet when the nation of Israel rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, not only in his incarnation, but in his resurrection, the wrath of God that's coming over here, I should put it on the board, 
The wrath of God is going to be poured out, folks. This is called the 70th week. It's the day of uh, Jacob's trouble. That's the Antichrist here. He comes in the world to become the false Christ. But what God did is something special. God revealed a secret purpose called the mystery in the But Now program, where he interrupted prophecy by saving Saul of Tarsus, the Lord Jesus Christ did, and we just read the verses and, and offered him salvation, not only to Paul, but all men without distinction. The middle wall falls down for Israel. The, the middle wall partition is, is broken down in the book of Acts. And God sets Israel aside, and now there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. That's Romans 2. And then what Paul does, Paul then is saved as the chief ambassador to go out and explain to men what this mystery program is, but more importantly, what the cross of Christ accomplished. He's talking about the faith of Christ there. So God's purpose is to take the church, the body of Christ, out of here. When, when the dispensation of grace is over, by the way, this is a grace period. This is called grace. And when the dispensation of grace is over in the button now, he's going to take the body of Christ out of here, and then Israel's prophetic program will be completed. It's been suspended. It's not thrown away. It's been suspended for a time and a reason. So you and, a time, you and I are in a time where God has allowed sin to abound. But you know what the Bible says? That where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Folks, I'm glad you're here today. And for the glory of God and, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we just pray that somebody heard some of these words from God's infallible book. I'm Pastor Russell Shepherd. At the end of the program, you'll see an email where you can contact us uh, for any further information. If you want a package about what we've been talking today, we'd be happy to send it to you. So until we see you next time, Maranatha.